Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the underlying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize in the, one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Gary Trudeau and Jules Pfeiffer or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Emily Bernard and Kurt Anderson. I'm sorry to say that Miranda Beeson is unable to join us tonight, but we will reschedule her for this coming spring or summer. I will return at the end, after the readings and discussion, to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, I see many of you have noticed the chat on the right-hand side. Please feel free to comment throughout the evening with anything you'd like to contribute. But if you have a question, there is an Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your screen, which is where I will go to find your questions. Also, there is the Write America page with Bird's Books in the green square at the bottom of the screen, and that's where you can go and to see our entire schedule and join us on another Monday night. Now, for a little bit about our first reader. Emily Bernard was born and grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and received her PhD in American Studies from Yale University. She has been the recipient of grants from the Ford Foundation, the NEH, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Resident Fellowship at Harvard University. Emily Bernard is a 2020 Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Her essays have been published in journals and anthology, among them The American Scholar, The Best American Essays, and Best African American Essays. She is the Julian Lindsay Green and Gold Professor of English at the University of Vermont. Additionally, she is the author of Black is the Body, Stories from My Grandmother's Time, My Mother's Time and Mine, Carl Van Vechten and the Harlem Renaissance, A Portrait in Black and White, Some of My Best Friends, Writings on Interracial Friendships, and Remember Me to Harlem, The Letters of Langston Hughes and Carl Van Vechten. Please welcome to the screen, Emily Bernard. There you go. Hi, Alice. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. I have so much gratitude to Roger for including me in this wonderful mission, and I'm honored to be reading with her tonight. We're going to, be, we're going to miss Miranda, but we're going to have some fun. I want to read some new work um, from a book I'm working on called Unfinished Women. It's loosely a collection of eight biographical essays about Black women. I'm trying to see if it's possible to tell a kind of cohesive story about the experience of Black women in this country. I'm also interested in getting at the heart of some central questions about biography as an enterprise. What does it take to tell a complete story of a life? This story I'm going to read to you now, like most of my stories, begins in some larger way in Mississippi, where my mother grew up. After months of pleading, negotiating, and planning, Julia Davis gets on a plane in Jackson, Mississippi one morning and arrives in Burlington, Vermont in the afternoon. When I pick her up at the airport, I'm amazed, as always, by how much she resembles her older sister, Clara Jean, my mother. The same large brown eyes and shapely lips. As we gather her luggage, we reflect on the fact that my mother has been dead for almost a decade. I've always felt close to my aunt, who, at 70, is younger than my mother by 11 years. Clara Jean had three younger sisters, but Julia. 
From a young age, I could see that she was open to the world in a way I wanted to be, that she was willing to entertain all of what life had to offer. One sister went into the military, another sister stayed in Mississippi. My mother became a housewife, but Julia led out to California, having one adventure after the next, or so it seemed to me as a child. My aunt is half her usual self, I notice as we arrange her bags in my trunk. Depression, she says simply, when I remark on her dramatic weight loss. Julia left California to go home to Mississippi after my grandmother Dotsie, having grown weaker and weaker from a succession of strokes, could no longer take care of herself. Dotsie was ready to die at 94. The preceding few years under Julia's care had been very difficult for both of them. Dotsie's decline was hard and Julia had no experience as a caretaker. Not one to complain, Julia doesn't talk much about what it was like for her, but I know it was debilitating. Once during an emotional conversation after her mother's death, my brothers and I insisted that she move in with one of us if she too lost the power to care for herself. She said, you have no idea what you're offering to give up. It is October. As you drive to my house, I watch Julia as she takes in the Vermont fall from her window. The true distance between Burlington, Vermont and Hazelhurst, Mississippi can't be measured in miles. The lie is that we live in one country and one culture, a united story of the United States. We pass small white churches and the tall slender sleep with steeples. It's 60 degrees outside, but people are wearing shorts. How foreign this must be, I think. I look around for black people. Thinking that the sight of a brown body would put my aunt at ease. In this moment, I forget that Julia has traveled outside of the country more than most Americans. For years, she had a boyfriend in Jamaica whom she saw regularly. During her career as a programmer at Pacific Bell, she navigated plenty of majority white spaces. I underestimated my aunt. People have been doing that to her all her life. Julia was in elementary school when my mother left for college. She was a teenager when Clara Jean disappointed her father profoundly and forever by getting married a few years after graduation. An army captain, my grandfather, Julius Jefferson, whom Dotsie called Jeff, was not a feminist, but my grandmother gave him no sons. Jeff wanted more for his oldest daughter than wife. You paid all of that money for Clara Jean's education and all she did was up and get married. Jeff's brothers chastised him. My mother would later regret her marriage, but she would never have given my grandfather the satisfaction of telling him so. Clara Jean married as an act of defiance. She hated her father, who was an alcoholic and resented the way he foisted his own dreams upon her. Jeff lost all interest in his other daughters after my mother disobeyed him. He retired from the military to his living room where he sat silent in the dark and watched television, a bottle at his feet. Julia, his namesake, felt for him. Even though he neglected her and despite the forbidding dense shadow he cast inside the house, she felt his humanity. Whenever Jeff entered a room, the two youngest girls would leave in protest, but Julia stayed. She sat in the dark with the lonely man, so pitifully out of sync with his own family and kept him company while he immersed himself in Westerns and sports. That's why I'm a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan to this day, she says. My aunt was so young when my mother left home that I know things she doesn't remember about her own childhood. She doesn't remember, for instance, that my grandfather could be a violent drunk. She doesn't remember how viciously her parents fought and that her mother sometimes hid from her father when he was on a bender. What Julia doesn't remember, my mother never forgot. Clara Jean carried her rage toward her father to the very end of her life. Looking back, I believe that rage was the defining feature of her life. The disgust my mother felt for her father fueled her creative imagination. I know about those terrible times, not only from what she told me, but from the way she rendered those episodes in her poems. Jeff, a lifelong depressive, a malignant husband, army captain, handsome and magnetic, a poor excuse for a father, a sad, lonely man brooding in the dark, a lover of Westerns and football, a source of literary inspiration. He was all of these things we know and many things we may never know. The same is true for everyone. There are so many ways of looking at a life. By the time Aunt Julia steps out of the car, my daughters are halfway down the driveway to greet her. My husband, John, takes her bags up to her room and then we all visit for a bit until Julia says 
She'd like to stretch her legs after the long airplane ride. John offers to accompany her on a walk around the neighborhood. Later, Julia tells me that on their walk, John confided to her some of his worries about one of our daughter's performance in school. Julia was impressed that he cared. You have to expect things from children, she told him. She knows this from hard experience. Julia spent her childhood in Hazelhurst, contending not only with her father's neglect, but also her mother's deprecation. The other girls had that Jefferson smarts, Dotsie would say to her, but you're dumb like me. Julia suffered from what today would probably be described as a learning disability. Regardless, she stopped trying in school. I bought into it, she tells me, referring to her mother's diagnosis. You're dumb like me. When it was time for standardized testing, Julia didn't even look at the questions. She sat at her desk and penciled in random cells, cells on the answer sheet. Julia left Hazelhurst at the first opportunity. Her father had a son, Ken, from a previous relationship who lived in San Jose. Julia could live with him, his wife, and three kids for a while, Ken said, while she attended community college. Julia loved her life in San Jose, even though Ken's wife was difficult to take. She treated Julia like a bumpkin, acted shocked when Julia used the word avocado in a sentence. She didn't believe that a country girl from a tiny town could possibly know what an avocado was, so she made Julia point one out at a grocery store. True to form, Julia kept her hurt hidden and focused on the bright side of things. After all, she was in California, a world away from Mississippi, and she was meeting people from all walks of life. Among those people was a talented, good-looking young baseball player who would become her husband. You're dumb like me. Despite her excitement over how things were unfolding, the cruel words from her old life crept back into her head and took up residence in her heart. She did not love the gifted baseball player. Other people admired him though, and she didn't think she could do much better anyway. The fact that he didn't love her either did not register as a problem. She was used to disappointment when it came to matters of the heart. And Julia dropped out of college and got married. She thought she could replicate the domestic life her older sister, Clara Jean, was living. She didn't know that Clara Jean's story too was full of holes. Julia's marriage ended disastrously. It was one of those situations when you leave with the clothes on your back, she said. Her husband, she discovered too late, had been practicing economic deceit for years. By the time she got out of the marriage, there was nothing left. Still, good things kept happening. She got a job at the phone company, Pacific Bell. She decided she wanted to become a programmer. It looked like interesting work, like solving a puzzle, she explains. In order to develop the necessary skills to be competitive for a position, she apprenticed herself to a manager in the field, an intimidating grouch. She chose him as a mentor over others who were easier to get along with. Why? He knew what he was doing and I knew how to handle him, she tells me. You, have a lot, you had a lot of experience dealing with peop difficult people who had power over you, I say. Julia was an excellent programmer. The company rewarded her with a lucrative salary that helped her recover, for the most part, from the financial damage wrought by her ex-husband. She traveled to Jamaica where she met a man. She and Walter took trips all over the Caribbean. It was a period of reinvention. She could never free herself from the tug of the old story. You're dumb like me. Her grumpy mentor wanted to promote her, but she declined. With a kind of bewildered sadness, Julia realized she had reached a limit of faith in herself. When layoffs came to Pacific Bell, Julia wasn't protected by status like her manager. She wasn't fired. They eased her out, giving her less and less work to do. Eventually, she gave up. After 29 and a half years at Pacific Bell, she accepted a buyout package. It was generous, but she would have rather kept programming. Still no hard feelings, never hard feelings. Without meaningful work, Julia lost her sense of purpose. The one thing that was certain in her life was her mother's de declining health. She decided she would go home to Hazelhurst, but still try to maintain some kind of life in California. She became quickly overwhelmed by her mother's needs and found it wasn't possible for her to travel at all. By the time Dotsie died, Julia's longing for and curiosity about the world was answered mainly through postcards and letters Walter would send from his travels. 
And then Walter died too. And Julia's making a record of her visit to Vermont in photographs. What she wants more than anything for her album is a picture of a covered bridge. I have a terrible sense of direction. So I take clear instruction from John on where to find the right bridge for my aunt. It turns out that the right bridge is in our way to Virgins, a small town where I plan to take Julia for lunch. But we are talking so much that I missed the term for the bridge, not just once, but twice. I'm embarrassed, but my aunt laughs and brushes it off. It's clear who's the driver in your family, she says. The cafe is authentic Vermont. Pristine, sloping wood floors, bright colors, and sandwiches with clever names. My aunt described herself as an observer, so I make sure we find a table near a window. A clean rectangle of light hits the table right in the center. You're brave, you know, my aunt says. What do you mean? I still feel a sting of embarrassment over not having been able to find the bridge. Look at you. You married outside of your race. You moved all the way up here to Vermont. I am astonished. I've never looked at my life this way. I thought about how often I've chastised myself for my conventional life decisions down to depending on my husband to drive me and our children around. But I don't want to contradict my aunt. I am enjoying this alternate lens through which to view the choices I've made. Plus, her story of my life belongs to her, not me. I tell her how odd I am by her stories and all she has lived through. She says there's nothing so great about coming full circle, winding up in the place you once longed to escape. She looks out of the window and back at me. Sometime before it's all over, she says, I would just like to know what my life was for. Thank you. No, thank you, Emily. We'll see you in just a little bit. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Kurt Anderson. Kurt Anderson's latest book, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, is about the re-engineering of U.S. society to serve big business and the rich at the expense of everyone else. It was a Times bestseller like its companion volume, Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, about America's weakness for exciting falsehoods. He is also the author of four critically acclaimed best-selling novels, You Can't Spell America Without Me, True Believers, Heyday, and Turn of the Century. He writes for television and the stage as well. Previously, he created and hosted the public radio program Studio 360, co-founded Spy Magazine, served as editor-in-chief of New York Magazine, and was a columnist for the New Yorker, Time, and New York. His work has won many awards, including the Langham Prize for the year's Best American Historical Novel and two Peabody Awards. Please welcome to the screen, Kurt Anderson. Let me snag you over here. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Alice. <clears throat> um, I will also thank Roger Rosenblatt before I go on. Um, this is the 40th anniversary of him volunteering to be my mentor and my eagerly taking him up on it. And here he is 40 years later, Continuing. Um, hold on, I'm going to turn down the volume because I keep hearing myself. Um, here we are. Anyway, I'm going to read pieces from two of my books, um, one fiction, one nonfiction, uh, maybe partly to help illustrate how there are sibling connections and how those while obviously very different in all the obvious ways, uh, at least in one's own work, um, they are something like siblings. So first I'm gonna read from True Believers, which is uh, a novel I published in 2012. Uh, it was my first first person novel. Uh, it is a, a make-believe memoir of a, of a 60 something woman called Karen Hollander. And of course this is 2012. So before Karen uh, would have been a more dubious name for a uh, a character, probably. Um, it, she was as a child and still, but especially as a child, an obsessive, immersive reader of books. Uh, she's a former big time Department of Justice official, uh, possible Supreme Court nominee. The chapters go back and forth between the 1960s and her youth to the present day. And the central, not exactly MacGuffin, but big 
dark secret of her past that she reveals in this book is this violent criminal plot uh, by her and some her radical college friends back in 1968. I've redacted the spoilers from this bit, so you can still read the book and not know what's going to happen. So late in the book, chapter 29. 46 springs ago, I decided my tragic flaw was an overactive imagination, my love of stories, that I would never again assume the guise of some fictional character. No more young King Arthur or Alice, no more Howell Beatnik, no more Bond girl, no more new left mother country gorilla. As things turned out, I've had to play a different fictional character for these last 46 years. I admire my 18 going on 19 year old self for having the acuity and will to see what I'd been doing my whole life, imagining myself as a fictional character and then decide to quit doing it. It wasn't until many years later that I came to understand it wasn't only Alex and Chuck and I who had quasi fictionalized ourselves that we'd been afflicted by a pandemic perceptual glitch. In the 1960s, Metaphors started to seem more real to more people than ever before. Sure, we all lived in the ordinary world, writing checks, shampooing our hair, stopping at red lights, and we continued to understand that novels and movies and comic books and dreams were unreal. But with the 1960s, I think, came a new hybrid consciousness, an in-between realm where the metaphorical and the fantastical mingled with the literal and the everyday. I don't think it was caused by the sudden wholesale use of marijuana and LSD, although those drugs certainly enhanced the sensation of not quite real but not quite fictional life. The three times I took psychedelics, I never thought the strangers I encountered were literally lizards or mutant angels or extraterrestrials. And when I was stoned, I didn't literally think the TV had turned into one of Big Brother's telescreens from 1984. But some of those strangers seemed very, very lizardy, and the government seemed powerful and malevolent in a way it never had previously. To millions of other people, starting in the late 60s and early 70s, notions that for years had been safely metaphorical, such as the miraculous stories in the Bible, turned literal. Because so many people of so many different types experienced the same glitch at the same time, I think it seemed like a new feature of consciousness rather than a bug. This glitch sped, spread beyond hippies and radicals and Jesus freaks, and it was never entirely repaired. 21st century people fictionalized themselves like mad. When I was little, the women who dyed their hair were outré. Now we all do. Cosmetic surgery is all about self-fictionalizing. People have online avatars and pseudonyms and turn themselves into fictional online farmers or fictional killers who form guilds and cults to embark on missions and quests to destroy zombies and vampires and elves and spend billions of real dollars buying entirely fictional digital merchandise. In the real world, adults insist that their counterfactual fictions, the US government arranged the 9-11 attacks, the president is a foreigner, are true and dress up in costumes to Go out and call moderate politicians fascists, traitors, antichrists. Real life has become a massive multiplayer role-playing game. Now that idea and effectively that passage from that novel grew into a main pillar of um, my next book. This is Kurt Anderson talking, not Karen Hollander right now, uh, which uh, was my first big work of nonfiction. It was, it was a history called Fantasyland that Alice mentioned. <clears throat> um, and so really the, the, that was a seed that grew not into that whole book, but a good chunk of it. Um, also near the end of True Believers, uh, Karen is musing about how some of her fellow liberals consider her a bit of a heretic and, and politically unreliable. During a panel discussion about immigration that I was moderating, I mentioned that in the 1960s and 70s, Cesar Chavez and his union members had lined up at the U.S.-Mexican border to keep Mexicans from entering the country illegally, and that they also turned in undocumented immigrant farm workers to the feds. 
An audience member accused me of, quote, smearing a hero with falsehoods. And a fellow panelist said I was, quote, being a useful idiot to the racists and xenophobes by, quote, dragging up irreverent old history. She goes on and on about that, talking about how she's about to be an incredible useful idiot to the right of 2014 um, when this novel set by exposing herself as the terrible violent lefty she was uh, and that <clears throat> the, the right would make a heyday out of it. Um, also from that same novel, this passing notion and phrase became a significant bit of my sequel to Fantasyland another nonfiction book called Evil Geniuses that Alice mentioned. So from fiction to nonfiction, back to another bit of it from into, into, into nonfiction. Um, and this is a bit from an excerpt uh, from, from Evil Geniuses that the Atlantic Magazine published. Uh, and it was headlined, College Educated Professionals Are Conservatism's Useful Idiots. In the book, I am in the course of uh, talking about my evolution, intellectual political evolution um, and epiphanies uh, in the early 2000s. And I say, <clears throat> I thought, mea culpa, for those past two decades, I'd prospered and thrived in the new political economy and unharmed by automation or globalization or the new social contract, I had effectively ignored the fact that the majority of my fellow Americans weren't prospering or thriving. What has happened since the 1970s and 80s didn't just happen. It looks more like arson than a purely accidental fire, more like poisoning than a completely natural illness, more like a cheating of the many by the few. And although I've always been predisposed to disbelieve conspiracy theories, this amounts to a long-standing and well-executed conspiracy, not especially secret by the leaders of the capitalist class at the expense of everyone else. A raw deal replaced the new deal. And I and my cohort of hippie to yuppie liberal baby boomers were complicit in that. A little later in the book, I'm describing my, my own life as a kind of teenage and young adult neoliberal, when neoliberal meant something else uh, <clears throat> in the 1970s. I wasn't romantic or quite as enthusiastic about unions as liberals and Democrats used to be. In fact, the basic college-educated liberal attitude toward unions was evolving from solidarity to indifference to suspicion, the result of a crack up at that very moment of the old New Deal political coalition. The anti-war movement and counterculture coming right after the successful civil rights movement had generated intense mutual contempt between those two main kinds of white Democrats, members of the working class and the expanding so-called new class. The televised beatings by Chicago police of protesters outside the Democratic Convention in 1968 was the most spectacular early episode in the crack up, although there were others most notably an organized attack in New York City by union construction workers on young anti-war protesters in May 1970 that became known as the Hard Hat Riot. Beginning right then, the suspicion and contempt between less educated white people and the liberal white bourgeoisie became what the American class struggle was most visibly and consciously about. And it would define our politics as the economy was reshaped to do better than ever for yuppies and worse and worse for the proles. A reason people like me found unions kind of uninteresting was that a unionized job was almost by definition an uninteresting job. When I started work as a writer at Time Magazine in 1981, I joined the union, the newspaper guild, but I understood that everything I cared about in that job, good assignments, decent salary increases, titular honorifics, would be entirely at my editor's discretion, not a function of collectively bargained rules. A union? Sure, fine. But I was talent. I was creative. I was an individual. College graduates tend to think of themselves that way. Younger ones all the more. Younger baby boomers at the time, probably the most ever. And the intensified, all-encompassing individualism that blew up during the 1960s, I do my thing and you do your thing, 
was not a mindset or a temperament that necessarily reinforced feelings of solidarity with fellow workers or romantic feelings about unions. What happened at newspapers and magazines back then also had disproportionate impact on this history of the rights hijacking of America's political economy. Because once journalists were actively ambivalent about organized labor, that disenchantment spread more contagiously than if it had just been random young professionals bad-mouthing unions. News stories about labor now tended to be framed this way rather than that way or were not covered at all. Thus, like most Democratic politicians at the same time, media people became enablers of the national change in perspective from left to right concerning economics. During the 1930s and 40s and 50s, the right had derided liberal writers and editors as the communist useful idiots, unwittingly doing the communist propaganda work. It looks in retrospect as if, starting in the 1970s, a lot of them, of us, became capitalists' useful idiots. And that is, those that's those two pieces, and you see that there's, uh, you know, they, 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 they share various pieces of DNA, and it's a, in my writing life anyway, it's a kind of spiral between the various things I do, one feeding off the next, and now I would uh, hope Emily can come back and we can talk. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. I really, I, I, that's a perfect segue because the question I wanted to begin with has to do with, I guess, the overall arc of things um, in your creative life. Uh, you've done so many things. And as you know, I was treating myself today to episodes of Studio 360. And I listening to you, you your voice is so um, recognizable. I love the way you use sentences. Um, and I wanted to ask about that. I mean, it seems to be, I, I hear you in both pieces and both genres. And I wonder about um, your, your experience as a radio person and how that's impacted the way you tell stories and shape narrative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question and it, and it really has. I mean, starting to speak professionally and being conscious of voice and the music of voice and the sound of sentences. I mean, I was already a writer, I already had that, but doing it, Speaking out loud as a, as part of my professional life, actually, I think did change the way I wrote. And certainly, you know, um, having I, I I had done it for a decade when I first, when I decided to write this first person novel, um, which is in somebody's voice, and of course not my voice, this fictional character's voice, but it did help. And it it, it, it so the, the, it was connected in that way, I guess, in the actual in the actual writing when when you're when you were writing. I mean, writing for, as you know, right? I mean, writing for for speech uh, is is very different than writing to be read. It just is, and you know, I mean, some some writers write more conversationally in a natural way than others. But so it it definitely had that effect. And then just in general, I guess um, the other the effect the 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 opposite in the opposite direction. I I think the fact that I was writing novels and you know, I produced screenplays and 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 some produced plays and so forth, um, I think uh, actually gave me some standing to have conversations with the, all the amazing artists and designers and performers and actors and everybody that I, you know, interviewed on that show. I wasn't just like, you know, the dude at CNN, you know, I, 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 I you know, had some at least understanding of, of what they did. So I think, you know, the, the, the writing helped that as well. Um, w w when I started college, because my one of my elder sisters was already becoming starting to become a professor at the time, I thought, oh, academics, that looks pretty good. Um, and and for a variety of reasons, I didn't choose to pursue that as a career. You are a professor, um, <clears throat> and and uh, as I was reading. You're in, and what you read is a great example of that. You're incredibly honest and incredibly lucid and totally jargon-free essays and pieces um, that everybody can understand. Um, I, I was reminded of, of many, many books I've read the last few years doing research for these two nonfiction books of mine, which are by academics. And so many of them are so terrible. Um, and, and, I, and I thought, again, 
you know, you can't tell you're a professor from from from, from reading your book, that, which is to say, it doesn't have this opaque, uh, jargony stuff that that you know. Okay, if it's math and science, okay, fine, but but that really bugs me personally when it comes to you know the social sciences and especially the humanities. I just wonder. It, does that make you a kind of outsider in in the academic world as <laughs> as a, as an extremely good writer? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm sure there there are people who think I'm um, that I'm, I'm doing academic writing badly. There are probably people who feel that there's you know see it that way. But clarity is something I, it's really important to me, you know. And I think because you know uh, thinking about my aunts and so many really curious and hungry literary people who um, would find academic writing really confusing and alienating. You know, I, I want to be able to write books that my aunt will find interesting, you know, and I, I think that's important. I also um, never found that language be very useful. You know, it comes down to just a few stock phrases and you can get away with a lot. And I, I think uh, the writers that I responded to uh, were after kind of a precision and not, um, you know, uh, populist kind of slogans and it's something that still that I still go for you know I want to be able to break it break things down but that's a question that I want to turn back to you the question of audience um, because I love also the way you're you're you um you seem to be speaking to really uh, there's a wonderful kind of democratic quality to your to your eye the way you look at the culture um taking it all in and creating this wonderful landscape. And um, do you think that, is that important? Who do you, who are you writing for when you think about audience? Uh, I, it is important to me. And, and, and by the way, just let's stipulate you meant small d democratic. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, not, not that we're embarrassed about being a large d democrat as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I, there's a lot to talk about in that question. I, I, I do have a, you know, I, like you, much younger than me, but certainly I am fully of a generation where the distinctions between high and low were were properly and wonderfully and gleefully erased uh, to a great extent. So, so yeah, I've I've always felt in my writing that I can, you know, simultaneously be down and dirty and erudite if, or whatever, you know, and and but. I, I want people to understand me, and certainly, certainly, whether it's whether it's fiction or or certainly in these nonfiction work, I, you know, I don't dumb it down at all. But I, but I don't want only, you know, adepts to understand. I don't want it to be abstruse. I want to understand it. And and again, uh, having doing the the radio show was was it was a good uh, exercise in. In, in a couple of things that you you talked about, you, you know, you asked about in terms of audience. One is like, these are just people like you, like me, like the people watching this show, just intelligent people. They're intelligent enough to understand all kinds of things, but you don't have to make it feel like they have to have gone to graduate school. No, no shade being cast on a PhD. Um, but, you know, and, and so democratic in that sense, um, the other thing, when I when I first when they, when the, the radio people found me and said, "Hey, we think you can do this," I said, "Why? I, I've never done anything like this." And and uh, they they said, "Why?" But then then they said, "You know," they all said, as though they were reading from a script. They all said, "You know, radio is this very intimate medium," and I never thought of that before. I always think I think of actually writing books and especially writing fiction as as very intimate and naked and exposed and really writing for some kind of, you know, hypothetical individuals, sometimes actual individuals, but, you know, uh, but I never, but, but somehow talking feels more naturally intimate than writing, you know? So I think that was a good exercise to make me really feel and realize that, that sense of intimacy that maybe I hope informed uh, my, you know, work as a writer, but like when, I mean, you, you, I, I heard an interview uh, that you did uh, last year, I guess, during the pandemic, definitely, um, maybe 2020, I lose track, um, but where you said that eh, you, you don't really think about the audience, and, and I just, I want to say, 
I wonder what you meant. Literally, you don't think, or or is it just like you're at you're writing for? You know, I don't have. A, I usually don't have a single person in mind. I think um, you're just trying to get it down right. You know, I always think it's 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 you're casting a line. You know, the message in the bottle, and just hoping that there's another preacher on this planet who can understand. And I'm, I think the writing is searching for that reader. You know, yeah. um, and maybe the reader that I was. You know, I think I still. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I just remember that, you know, 14 year old who spent, you know, as much time as possible reading and just, you know, I, I remember that person and and want to uh, capture that again. Totally. How about you? Yeah. Well, totally. And I often think, you know, I mean, especially when I've dabbled and, you know, written a little bits for television and stuff like that. Um, I, I realized I, I could never, I can only really write, um, for myself in a certain way. I mean, or or versions of me or friends of mine. I, I can't, you know, I can't second guess it. Oh, this would be, this would appeal to, you know, housewives over 40 or so. I, I mean, all those, th those kinds of wholesale audience, <laughs> imaginary audiences, I just, I have no ability to do because um, in the end, I, I, I can really only <laughs> appeal to myself, either the 14 year old version or, or not. Uh, one thing I realized as I was thinking about this, and since you are this master of the essay, um, is, and I find when I write, and especially when I write nonfiction, that I, I, I do it in a way, in a sense, to figure out what it is I really think. You know, I, I, I have, oh, I think I think this, or I think I have this idea. But then, you know, unless you're just typing it out immediately, which I, that doesn't happen to me. You spend time stewing and thinking and thinking some more and reading some more and finally starting to write and 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 I not always but usually I think find that I I think I have my sense of what I think about this at the beginning is different from what I think about it at the end. I wonder how much you sense you change your thoughts about whether it's your aunt or you know all the or or anything you write about. I, I, I think I, I, I begin the same way you do. You know, I think that for me, the difference between the academic writing that I've done and writing creatively is, you know, when I am writing an academic paper, I have an argument and I know what I, and I know what I want you to think, you know, so I'm going to just take your hand gently and lead you to my conclusion. But when I write creatively, I, I go in with a question, usually something, you know, something's bothering me. And it is a, just a matter of pursuing that and, and trying to, you know, get to the heart of experience, you know, it's impossible, yeah. right? We can't really do that. We can't actually capture experience, but that's what we're trying to do, reproduce for a reader or for ourselves, you know, just remember experience. I think that becomes more and more urgent, um, I think, quest for me as I, as I get older, just trying to collapse that distance between language and experience. Well, what, what they, again, I, I hadn't thought of it this way until just this second, but what, what your work is not, what they are not, these pieces, are, are, are lectures, right? It's not like you, you expose the making of them in this thrilling way. I, I think this amazingly excellent essay piece you wrote, I wouldn't even call it an essay. Well, of course it is, but uh, in 2004, 2005, called Teaching the N-Word in the American Scholar, uh, in which you talk about teaching, you know, these classes of University of Vermont white kids about that word. And, and, and whether they can not say the N-word, but actually the word. Um, and uh, and and the way you, you, you know, into this, it's not just, here's my pedagogy and here's my belief on this subject. You, you, you are very revealing of your moment to moment, you know, exploiting your teacherly power, talking to your husband. I mean, all of these bits that make this so much better than in that case than any other thing i've ever read about that subject um and i read randall kennedy's book by the way you 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 who which you refer to in that piece but like man it was really good and you say one thing i a line i wrote down or underlined i do think that something is you say to these kids i do think that something is lost when you don't articulate it it's meaning the n-word especially if the context almost demands its articulation which is holy cow, 
and I, and and I and you as you depict saying this to the these young people, young white people, eighteen years ago, it was kind of holy cow. Then in twenty twenty two, is it like is that like even thinkable, or have you changed your mind, or what? Well, I'm just wondering about that. Well, I haven't. I, I still I still like that essay, and I still believe everything I wrote. But I I'll say this: um, when my book first came out, I I did an event in Manchester, Vermont, um, and it was wonderful. This is great, you know, bookstore, um, a lot of happy people in the audience. And in the introduction to the book, that word appears um, as a, a reference to the essay you're talking about. And I read, I read part of that and I said the word. And unfortunately, when I looked up, the person I made eye contact with was a, a young black, a black boy. So that was just the first indication that this was maybe something was happening. I at, at the Q and A, a white woman used the word in the same spirit I had used it. You know, just to refer back to the, and you could have you could have felt the electric shock go through the room. So that was number two. And then I was in the back signing books at the end, and a black woman who I hadn't seen came up to me and said, "You know, I was having a really great time at the reading." And then when the woman said the word, I just couldn't hear anything else. And so I thought, that's the last time I'm going to say that word in public because I'm just not in the business of hurting people. I mean, it really comes yeah. down to that. So as you said at the beginning, there's a difference between writing something and then reading it out loud. And I think that that experience, you know, is, is just, it's damaging. It just is. It's rhetorical violence. Um, but I do think that it becomes a problem that we we're in the middle of now we're so focused on language and policing each other's language and there are i i just can't convince me that there are not bigger battles to to prepare for so oh, when yeah. we get caught up you know and well you can't say this and that makes you this i just think is is this really i mean is there really a direct line between the you know this particular word and, and if we solve this problem what does this really solve so i'm not settled on this issue um and I do think that language is always evolving and people should push boundaries and that's important. But um, I do know that I've retired my desire to ever say it out loud because it just, there's just no good in, in harming, you know, your audience when they come to hear you read. Well, or, or to become that, that person who says that word, you know, I mean, in 2004, you go, Ooh, it's a little edgy and Randall Kennedy's book had just come out and all that. I mean, you know, a generation later, Things are different and the context is different. different. I have right? a question for you kind of on that score, yeah. because, you know, like many people in this room, probably huge fans of Spy Magazine, which uh, you co-founded. And I'm curious whether you think, you know, I mean, in the same way, Spy was so irreverent. You know, I remember, uh, I mean, it was really, uh, it was a beacon of what the kind of thinking, uh, you know, I wanted to be around. Could that magazine exist now? Like what, what made it possible for it to exist then? Do you ever think about that? In various ways, uh, that's that's a question worth asking. I mean, just in a kind of, uh, you know, it was it was the last pre digital moment, so it could be a physical magazine and have impact that a physical magazine cannot have today. I just you know, so there's that. Um, there's also the way in which um, we invented the internet. I'm joking. There is, however, much of what we did. It's it's spores has has is everywhere on the internet. You know, everybody tr is a comedian. Everybody's a satirist. Everywhere on the internet, right? So, like, what spy? You know, it's so. Whereas back in that day of the you know late eighties and nineties, we were we were the only game in town, kind of. So so yeah, it could exist, but like it would have it would just be one more thing uh, in this giant ironic snark fest that is. <laughs> modern American culture. Um, then there is the question off of the other, the, the segue to the previous conversation is, would we be canceled? You know, would, 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 would we, would, would each issue of Spy cause such an uproar on social media that, you know, we would become the Joe Rogan of, 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 of the moment? You know, it would change things. God knows. Not that, you know, not that we ever did anything in that way to shock, but you know, there was we we 
and, and I haven't gone through all the issues with that in mind, like, oh, could we get away with this? Could we get away with this? And in a way, I think we could get away in that sense with most of it. But it was already as it was because we were actually offending the powerful, whether they were at the New York Times or wherever they were, by investigating them and making fun of them and, and all that. That was scary enough, right? And 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 I, I I felt like I was on a you know, I don't know if I was on walking a high wire or touching an electric wire, but it was scary, uh, and and so like that would be uh, scary in all kinds of additional ways. I think in this day and age, probably, um, you uh, not, you know, I don't want to make everything about race. Although you said in somewhere, oh, in in the book, in in. Uh, uh, bodies, or uh, 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 that that race is your subject, essentially, right? Or, or and, and uh, so, uh, a similar question to like the N word in two thousand four. The this book, this wonderful book all, that I've only read half of uh, about uh, essays about interracial uh, friendships that you edited and contributed to. Um, would that be different now? Has has ha have the Tensions and oddnesses and difficulties and beauties of that changed in a generation? I think that, you know, there's a lot of cynicism now about that possibility of making bonds across so many divides. So I, I, I think that, yeah, I think that um, sometimes, you know, you feel silly insisting on intimate relationships as being part of the puzzle, you know, um, and I, but I have to still insist, I still believe, you know, in the interpersonal as a real site for all possible kinds of possibilities. I still love that the most human beings interacting, you know, like right now, you know, Roger has put us together, people who would not have met, you know, in ordinary life, but I still, this is, I believe in this too. This is my church as well. So I would definitely do it again, you know, um, and maybe there would be people who would think, well, this is, you know, this is silly, you know, this is not important, but I think it's essential. You know, we talk about um, systemic racism, but I, I, people can change systems. We have before, it can be done again. And I, so I do think of that, um, it's such a site of possibility, you know, um, when people get together and I, I, I just think I'll, I'll, that'll be, the, I'll take it to my grave. Hi folks, we've got a Hi, couple Alice. questions for you. Yeah. Thank you for a lively discussion. This has been awesome. Um, Anne Fadiman asked a couple of questions that I wanted to pass on. Uh, for Emily, when you're pondering the history of a complicated family, what criterion or instinct do you use to identify which stories will fascinate those outside your family? That's a great question by the great Anne Fadiman. Um, hi, Anne. Um, I think when it comes to the stories of... Um, my aunts in Mississippi, to me, there's something so powerful about these women living together um, who've all come back home. I, I find something so, you know, universal in that story. They all kind of went off to their different lives and they came back together and they have a lot to say about their lives. And they talk about their lives in universal terms, you know, um, and that is always attractive to me when a, an individual can see how you know, that your particular story fits into a larger narrative. So, and I grew up hearing those kinds of stories, you know, Southern storytelling is all about, put, where, where do I fit in the universal, you know? Um, and so I, I think I take the, the, the lead from the characters themselves. Uh, you know, usually it, it, it becomes evident uh, when I'm hearing these stories, which parts I think have, have something to say to a larger, to a, to a, to a broader, Kind of, you know, experience, uh, I'm not, and that's a terrible answer. But I'll, I'll email you later. <laughs> well, there's a second question that Anne asked, uh, and this one's to Kurt. I, it actually wasn't a question; it was more of a statement. But I'd like you to comment on it. You perfectly captured how all of us at Time Inc. felt about Newspaper Guild. I joined it too, but with an attitude identical to your, but with an attitude identical to yours, which I took back on regret which, excuse me, I have to restate that last sentence. I joined it too, but with an attitude identical to yours, which I look back on with regret from Ann Fadiman. Hi, Ann, as well. Um, 
Uh, well, yes, exactly, as you should, as I do, as as uh, not the, the, the this book, Evil Geniuses, is not about that, but it's a continuing chorus of, you know, should have known better, should have understood what was going on, should have paid more attention to, to, to you know, uh, all of it, and and I didn't, and and so, um, yes, there there's there's reason for regret of of, of obliviousness, and um, you know, the the I'm doing okay, and I'm a writer. What what's this union going to do for me? Um, so I spend some time about myself and my my peers and 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 older people who of our of our class, if you will, or our cast. Who who uh, basically um, said sorry, uh, you know, blue collar workers, we're not with you anymore. In a way that, of course, um, progressives and Democrats had had been for you know decades before. So yeah, it's 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 full of regret. Which which and trying to you know make amends for that is 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 part of the fuel for, for writing this book and, and, and having a different politics than I did 30 years ago. Well, I think that answers her follow-up when she followed up with a question is Kurt, would you would quote unquote regret characterize your own current feelings? And I think that does, um, yeah. that does answer the follow-up question. So I didn't kill I, anyone. But. Well, that's good news. <laughs> I do have a couple of my own questions because I am a bookstore and it all kind of comes back to books because the intention here is to get your writing into the hands of other people. The bottom line. What advice would you give to a writer working on their first book? Correct. You don't have to have any, but I know you. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, assuming you've done all the things that you have to do, which is to say, read and read everything in the world and and read always and really be wanting to do this and having the skills and all that. Uh, I would say, um, you know, well, it obviously depends what the book is. Um, I, I would say that there 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 are no rules and there are no formula, but the close the farther you're going to verge from uh, the, the more it, the more original you're going to be. Um, understand that each bit of originality is a risk. That's all. Uh, the other thing, the only the best piece of advice I ever got about writing fiction um, was from a friend of mine who's a novelist who's been writing novels much longer than I had, who said to me, and maybe it's obvious, and maybe lots of people have said it in different ways, but I never thought of it, which is that every novel is a mystery novel, um, which was it was of enormous importance for me in tr trying to do this thing I'd never done um, when I started doing it. So I would say, if you're writing a novel, see if that works for you. I, I would say um, coming here is a good a good stop. You know, um, I think it's important to be in community with writers in any way that's possible. And I think taking writing workshops are a good way to kind of dip your toe in and um, watch a writer at work, you know, hearing about how, how a story is born and comes to life. It's, it's good. It's what workshops can help you do that, learning from other writers and seeing someone who's done it for a while. So, and to keep writing. Thank you. Uh, my last question, what are you reading right now? I just finished a wonderful book called uh, Real Estate by Deborah Levy that knocked me off my feet. It's the last in a trilogy of living autobiographies she's written, and it's really fantastic. Uh, I am um, reading, I'm in the middle of a book called Eat the Document, which you may, people may know by Dana uh, Spiata. I think that's how her name is pronounced, um, which I, I meant to read back when I was writing that novel I read from uh, because they share some milieu uh and didn't then when i started writing it because i didn't want to be affected by it and it's fantastic it's a really really good book set in the 60s and 70s uh and i'm also i'll do a second and just to prime the pump and 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 wet the appetites of uh people because nobody has read this book yet because it's not out yet it's by my friend Susanna moore comes out i think uh the end of this year maybe early next year it's called the lost wife 
it's a history uh, of set in the 19th century of a woman based, inspired by a real life woman who, uh, a white woman who is in the middle, finds herself in the middle of the Indian wars in Minnesota. Extraordinary book. So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm very happy. I've very happily finished that and very happily reading the Spiona book. Well, we seem to be out of time, but thank you both so much. Your conversation and, and your work that you shared with us really has been inspiring. So I am going to minimize you and close out the evening. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Emily and Kurt for participating in Write America this evening. To everyone who tuned in tonight, and thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. We hope to see you next Monday as we welcome Elizabeth Hawes Weinstock and Vijay Sashadri to Write America. Please remember Bird's Books has the author's books and many of them are signed. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>